You've uh, heard from uh, our first uh, panelist, and therefore I'd like to move very quickly to our second and third, and also to announce for those of you who haven't uh, been informed that uh, unfortunately uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Bayan Sami Abdul Rahman, who's a representative of the Kurdish regional government, uh, is unable to join us this morning. So unfortunately we will not be hearing from her. Uh, let me start with Dennis to my left here. Uh, he needs no introduction to anybody who's been involved in the Middle East in the past two generations, uh, Dennis. <laughs> he's been, uh, he's been uh, a senior advisor uh, to presidents uh, starting with Ronald Reagan and all the way up to, uh, to President Obama, helping to shape and to implement American <laughs> policy in the, uh, in the Middle East, in the region, and in particular with respect to the Arab, uh, excuse me, with respect to the uh, Israel-Pakistan issues. Israel-Palestinian. Uh, uh, Israel-Palestinian, sorry. Uh, Israeli-Pakistani issue. Relations that's, that's, be interesting. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I say, he yeah. wouldn't have to spend too much time on that one. Right. So, Dennis, <laughs> without further ado, uh, please. Uh... Right, so um, I was going to offer a somewhat different perspective to begin with, but I, you know, I want to pick up on, on what you said. If I listen carefully to what you said, it sounds, and this may not have been what you intended, but it sounds as if the problem in Syria are the Islamists and not the Assad regime. Uh, and <coughs> excuse me, in a lot of ways, I think the Assad regime is responsible for creating the Islamist problem. If you go back and you look at the beginning of this conflict, and I was still in the administration at that time, uh, I recall meeting with a uh, young 30-year-old lawyer from Homs. He was part of the Revolutionary Council of Homs. Uh, and uh, he said, if the Muslim Brotherhood uh, replaces Assad, we lost the revolution. In other words, if, if, we were, if we replace Assad and the Muslim Brotherhood emerges, we lost the revolution. The beginning of this revolution was, in fact, a peaceful one. The effort, uh, all the demonstrations that began were demonstrations that were not calling for the removal of the regime. Uh, and unfortunately, it was Assad who declared war uh, on the, in a sense, on the Syrian people. In a lot of ways, part of the problem is that we didn't support those who were secular, uh, who were opposing the regime. Now, when money and arms flowed to the Islamists, and initially it wasn't Al-Qaeda, <clears throat> it wasn't the Islamic State, it was probably more the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, when a war is declared on you and the only ones who have money and arms basically uh, to, f to resist those who are imposing the war on you, you're going to end up with a gravitation to the Islamists, and that's what unfortunately happened. So the <coughs> Excuse me, I get all choked up when I talk about this issue. Um, so it's, you know, at, at one level, we're dealing with two terrible realities. We have a regime that has become a magnet for Islamists worldwide to come and fight, uh, who then pose the very threat you talked about internationally. We have Islamists, uh, you know, who, if you look at it, we have a, we have a highly fragmented opposition Many fight just to, to basically defend their local areas. We don't have, we, the U.S., does not have a coherent strategy. Uh, and the question is at this point, you know, what does one do? If you look at what our focus is today, we are, on the one hand, we're seeking to produce a political process. Everyone understands that a political process at the end of the day is probably necessary to try to resolve this conflict. And yet the question is, what's the balance of power? Anyone who is in, who's dealt with diplomacy, as I have for a long time, understands in the middle of a conflict situation, leverage is what matters. Putin decided that he was going to intervene in Syria to preserve a Russian foothold in Syria, to be an arbiter of whatever outcome is there, to send a message when it, in the region that when it comes to defining what this region is going to look like, if you want your interest to be preserved, you have to deal with Russia. 
The address is Moscow, the address is not Washington, D.C. Our position at this point is to go after the Islamic State, uh, and in the meantime, Russia attacks all the non-Islamic State opposition groups, many of which are Islamist, not all of which are Islamist, and they draw almost no distinction between them. It seems to me the answer ultimately, if you also want to staunch the refugee flow, and not all the refugees, I mean, I, I, I worry a little bit about your analysis because the implication of your analysis is that all the refugees are Islamists. They're not. No, maybe you didn't mean to say that and maybe I misinterpreted what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when you see families who are going and they have, you know, we've, you've, we all saw you know, these horrible pictures of, and you see these stories of these kids who have lost, you know, who are alone, literally alone. You know, we are looking at a humanitarian catastrophe. We were looking at a country where 12 million people are displaced, 300,000 people are dead. <laughs> we have a refugee crisis in Europe. Uh, and the answer to this, it seems to me, is to start by creating a safe haven. Uh, at least in the northern part uh, of Syria. What I mean by a safe haven is a place where A, refugees can go and be safe. And when we talk about the displaced people, by the way, in Syria, you know, it is almost an antiseptic way of talking about what is an unbelievably horrible reality. If you look at those who are displaced, they're living in conditions that you can't even imagine. We have a regime that doesn't just use barrel bombs against any, you know, the opposition, all opposition. We have a regime that basically bombs hospitals, sees that, you know, any place where people can, can collect, if, for example, to get food, is also a viable target. You know, you are, you are dealing with a circumstance that is almost incomprehensible and is a stain on the international conscience. What a safe haven should mean is a place where refugees can go, uh, where the area cannot be attacked, where the Islamic State cannot infiltrate. Uh, and if I were trying to design policy, I would actually have us say to the Russians, this is going to be an area off limits to you. You don't bomb it. <clears throat> the Syrian regime doesn't bomb it. Uh, we will create a no-fly. Uh, we will, you know, to ensure that in fact others share the burden of this, you would have Turkey provide forces on the ground to ensure ISIS can't infiltrate. You would say to the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, and others, you will provide the money to, since you've been clamoring for us to create a safe haven, the same with Turkey, you've been clamoring for us to do this, uh, you will provide the monies to create the infrastructure to be able to absorb the refugees. From now on, all monies for supporting and creating a viable opposition will go through one address and will go through us because we're the ones who are now establishing the safe haven which you've asked us to do. The Europeans who want the refugee crisis to stop, they have to contribute their air forces along with ours to do the no-fly. Now the value of this aside from the humanitarian potential is it also creates the potential to create more coherence among an opposition. You can't Today, the idea of having a political process that is going to work is wonderful and is completely not grounded in reality. There is no coherent opposition who could negotiate. There is no coherent opposition who could assume responsibility in a negotiation. Uh, there is a situation where the Assad regime wants to create their existence and everybody else is a terrorist. And, you know, if, if that's the equation, well, you know, that ensures this is an endless conflict. That ensures the Russians, you know, who want, who I think want to establish a position for themselves, but probably at some point do want this thing to end, if we want them to have a serious stake in a political process and not just one that, that they're the arbiters for, they also have to see that we're going to try to affect this reality in a way that at least gives the potential of creating a meaningful political process, creates the potential for a meaningful opposition to negotiate at some point, None of this can be created overnight because the situation is so horrible. But you've got to start in a place that isn't where we are right now. <clears throat> Our strategy right now is to basically, we're going to focus on trying to, to deal setbacks to the Islamic State in Raqqa. Right now, we are backing basically the Peshmerga, Peshmerga in the, 
uh, in efforts on the ground uh, from the air. We're going to put 50 special operations forces into the area. In the meantime, the Russians don't, you know, the Russians will bomb everybody else uh, and try to back the regime. Uh, and if you think that's a prescription for a political process, I think it's an illusion. So I would like to sort of focus on trying to create a safe haven. I don't expect the administration to adopt this at this point, although I would say one thing. The administration's posture you know, over time has been driven by a kind of, I would say the initial policy was one of avoidance. Then it became one of containment. Now it's one of trying to suggest, well, we're, we have a multi-pronged approach. On the one hand, we're going to try to deal setbacks to the Islamic State. On the other hand, we're going to pursue diplomacy. The idea of, and the Russians now have a plan to let's have an election. How can you have an election in the middle of a war zone? I mean, this is, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense unless you begin to change the realities on the ground and you create a safe haven. If you want a political process, ultimately you're going to have to create a, uh, you're going to have to create some kind of safe haven. And I would close with kind of one point. Um, I have a, I'm on a book tour right now, and the, even though the book is about the U.S.-Israeli relationship from Truman to Obama, what I really focus on in the book is showing how in every administration we've had a set of assumptions that have been towards the region as a whole. And those assumptions have basically misunderstood what tends to drive Arab leaders. What tends to drive Arab leaders is their preoccupation with security and survival. They look to the United States primarily for us being the ultimate guarantor of their security. They look to us as being reliable. You know, I want to cite an example from the past that will sound familiar. A lot of the book is about showing how there's echoes from the past that constantly reverberate over time. You know, the, in the fall of 1969, uh, Gaddafi replaced, there was a coup, he carried out a coup, he replaced King Idris uh, in Libya. At the time, in the aftermath of the, of the coup, Henry Kissinger records that every single one of America's friends, leaders at the time in the region, sent a message to President Nixon. And the message was literally the same. You know, the radicals are gaining in the region. Uh, you are passive in response. Uh, the regional balance of power is shifting against your friends. Uh, if you don't do something to respond to this, you leave us no choice but to act sort of on our own. Now, it sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? This is kind of the same message that we're getting now. We look at what the Saudis, by the way, are doing in Yemen. Uh, a lot of that is being driven by a sense that yes, there's a threat there, but they can't count on us to do much. If there is something we need to do to sort of demonstrate reliability and effectiveness again, which is what I would say is pretty important for us to achieve, it seems to me that we need to do something in Syria that shows we can change what is an awful reality. And where I agree with you is this is not a localized conflict. This is a conflict that is destabilizing the region. It is not just a humanitarian catastrophe, although it is. It is also a strategic and increasingly profound strategic problem. And our response at this point is not dealing with the source of that strategic problem. If the U.S. is also going to become better positioned in the region, and I, one other point I would say that where I do agree with you, much of the rest of our friends throughout the world look at what we're doing in the Middle East and they look at and they say, look, if the U.S. isn't going to do much there, if the U.S. is going to be ineffective there, why should we believe that they're going to be effective where we are? And so there, we do have a big stake in trying to affect this conflict. The way to do it is not to incrementally take small steps that can't succeed. Uh, you know, 50 special operations forces in Syria isn't going to change the reality there very much. <coughs> And even though it's going to be difficult to change the reality, we at least have to start by having a coherent concept. And I would say a safe haven is at least a coherent concept. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> now
<laughs> now let me turn to uh, Tom Lippman, who is a distinguished uh, journalist, author of numerous books on the Middle East, and in particular Saudi Arabia, his most recent uh, book. You can see his biography as uh, all the other speakers in your uh, program, and I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've had, I've had the opportunity to address several of the local World Affairs Councils on your own territory. They never did any of those events at 8.30 in the morning, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've listening to this conversation, I've changed a little bit the way I want to approach my remarks. It, I happened to be in Saudi Arabia in the fall of 2009. I mean, I've been there innumerable times over the decades, but I happened to be there uh, doing research for a book in the fall of 2009. <clears throat> when King Abdullah rolled out, he had an opening, a grand opening ceremony for his great personal legacy project, his gift to the country, his monument to himself, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology vast amounts of money, a very controversial institution within the kingdom because it's co-educational. But King Abdullah was probably the last person who still believed in Arab solidarity. And so he tried to use the occasion of this ceremony to build a bridge to his longtime rival and enemy, Hafez al-Assad, excuse me, Bashar al-Assad president of Syria. And the king did several things. He invited Assad to uh, the university as the number one guest, red carpet, sort of the royal welcome, you might say. Um, and then he accepted a reciprocal invitation from Assad to go on a state visit to Syria, which was greatly publicized. I, I was still in the kingdom at the time. He made sure that the Saudi press covered it extensively, took the editors of the newspapers with him. And then the Saudis made yet another gesture to Syria. They took the Hariri investigation off the table. The assassination of Rafiq Hariri, who was Saudi Arabia's guy in Lebanon, like all of a sudden, everybody stopped talking about it. When was the last time you heard about the Hariri investigation in which the Syrians were gonna be accused? And what was the response of Syria, of Assad, to these gestures from Saudi Arabia. The response was to invite Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to Damascus for a big kiss in. It's not nice to insult the king of Saudi Arabia. A lot of politics is personal in this part of the world, or tribal, or whatever you want to call it. So given that Syria and Saudi Arabia had been at odds since the 1980s, when Syria was uh, allied with Iran in the Iran-Iraq war. Syria, the only Arab country that supported the Persian Shiites against the Arab, against an Arab neighbor, which was theoretically run by the same political party as Syria. It's a long history of antipathy now. And so when the um, Arab Spring erupted in Syria in 2011, and I was back in Saudi Arabia for some time after that to discuss it. Um, it looked to the Saudis really almost as an opportunity, which was to get rid of Assad at very little cost to themselves. They had little, if any, reason to fear that the contagion of democracy would reach Saudi Arabia. And so they encouraged various factions in Syria, uh, just as you described. There's also a long history of Saudi financial and what you might call ideological support for um, uh, Salafist and radical groups within Islam. This goes, also goes back, there's nothing new in the Middle East. This goes back to 1979 when Saudi Arabia felt itself besieged and challenged for supremacy in the faith, first by the Iranian Revolution, and then by the armed takeover by extremists, just like Al-Qaeda, who took over the great mosque in Mecca and held out against the Saudi security forces for a couple of weeks. 
to the point where the Saudis, unable to dislodge the terrorists from their own greatest shrine, brought in help from, believe it or not, the French to dislodge. And what, and what was the agenda? What, was, what were the demands of those people who took over the mosque? They're pretty much the agenda, the agenda of the Islamic State today. Saudi Arabia was too close to the West. It was corrupt. Uh, they had um, unveiled women reading the news on TV. There was too much uh, affiliation with Western institutions. So there's a long history to this. And it, the opportunity to, um, to inflict some damage on Assad uh, seemed almost welcome at the time. Nobody foresaw, I think, the consequences that we now face today. And I, I want to add one thing, by the way. Uh, this has not been a happy year in Saudi Arabia. A lot of things have happened, and Syria is not even the biggest item on their agenda at the moment. That's Yemen. Some of you may have seen that very interesting story in the New York Times a few days ago about how the Saudis and Emiratis had actually moved a lot of their aircraft out of the fight in Syria and taken it down to Yemen. And there they have other allies, including the Egyptians. That brings me to a element in this that we can't yet really see the outcome of, and that's the price of oil. All right? The Iranians and the Russians derive most of their money from oil. $45 oil is not, is not a uh, welcome element in the calculations of the Iranians and the Russians. It's also a problem for the Saudis, not because they don't have the money to do what they're doing. Saudi Arabia's foreign currency reserves are greater than those of France and Germany combined. But at $45 oil, they have to start cutting somewhere. And if there's a lot of sentiment now in Saudi Arabia for cutting not support for various factions in Syria or the war in Yemen, but for cutting support to the biggest economic sinkhole in the Middle East, Egypt. Egypt is heavily dependent on um, economic support from Saudi Arabia, and it will never end. When I, when I moved to Egypt to take up residence there in 1975, Egypt had 40 million people. Today it has 80 million. The same resources, right? It'll never be self-sustaining. And the Saudis had Egypt on the economic hook which is why the Egyptian fleet was being used to blockade the ports in Yemen, right? There are so many overlapping elements in this that I don't believe Syria can be dealt with as if it were one problem under a glass dish. You, know, you, you can talk about all the elements that are involved in Syria, but everyone in Syria has had, except perhaps for the legitimate Syrian opposition, whoever they may be, everyone has multiple agendas. The Saudis certainly do. Um, one of the Saudis' agendas is to rebuild a relationship with the United States that they damaged because of their failure to comprehend or failure to accept what was going on in the nuclear negotiations with Iran. And the Saudis managed to convince themselves that somehow the United States was withdrawing its commitment to the Gulf. Every person in the government above the rank of GS-12 went to Saudi Arabia over the past two years to assure the Saudis and the other uh, Gulf, GCC Gulf countries that we were there, we had their back. We have troops everywhere from Interlick to Diego Garcia to Djibouti ensuring our commitment to our friends in the Gulf. And I've found now, I've sort of blunted my lance asking the Saudi, what exactly do you want from us? Except maybe to stop talking to Iran on any level, which we're not gonna do. I don't think we should do. So everybody is unhappy. Nobody knows what to do. But everybody also has more than one thing going on. And to some extent they overlap and to some they don't. So you could probably devise, as, as uh, Dennis Ross suggested, a way to create a kind of stopgap safe space in a part of Syria. You could do that, but then what? 
And for how long? And what's going to happen around that safe space? And what is the agenda? What is the real agenda of the Turks? Uh, I, I think this is there. It's important to understand the multiple layers of this cake and the difficulty of sorting them out. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think we've heard from our three panelists uh, words and uh, opinions that uh, tend to confirm the cover of uh, the latest Foreign Affairs magazine, which announced post-America Middle East. And the articles in there by very distinguished scholars and, uh, and authors on the Middle East uh, tend to point to a lack of a U.S. coherent policy, as was mentioned here by all three of our speakers. I guess I'd like to uh, kick off the, the question period with a question as to whether or not you agree that this is the post-American Middle East and, uh, and, and whether or not there is a role for the United States to play as in the past as the mediator, the conciliator, the, uh, the glue that holds together what have always been, it seems to me, at least in my experience and yeah. my, my career in diplomacy, conflicting and, uh, and contradicting policies and objectives of just about every country in the Middle East. I mean, we couldn't even get uh, un unanimity in 1991 to go into uh, to Kuwait, uh, and the unanimity was broken by one of our greatest partners in the Middle East over the years, Jordan. Uh, is, is it a possibility, uh, what you suggest uh, might be good for setting up a small uh, area as safe zone, but what, uh, I ask Tom's question, what comes next given the situation? And I'll, let's start with Dennis and Tom and then uh, you also as Rob. Look at, <clears throat> A, I don't think this is a, <clears throat> I don't think this is a post-America Middle East unless we make it that way. And I think if we choose to go that way, we will find that it has consequences beyond the Middle East. The role of the United States internationally generally is to lead, and when we don't lead, we see vacuums emerge and we see who tends to fill those vacuums. Putin is filling a vacuum that we help to leave. Uh, and it is not gonna make the Middle East a more stable place. It has already, the Russian bombing has already added another 100,000 refugees as a result. Uh, it is not going to make this region less conflictual in its character. When I raise the idea of a safe haven, it is to put you in a position where A, you can begin to staunch the refugee flow, B, you can create a basis actually for what could be a political process. We will not have a political process there. The fact that Secretary of State goes to Vienna, that doesn't make a political process. You know, a political process is created when you have the forces available, and I mean I don't mean forces in a military sense, I mean you have those elements available who could actually engage in a negotiation. What kind of negotiation is possible today? I actually don't see it. Who represents the opposition? I don't know. Uh, unless you create greater coherence, there isn't a political outcome. If you let this conflict continue as it is, it continues to get worse. Every time I hear someone say, you know, well, look at the cost of doing something. I say look at the cost of not doing something. It has consistently gotten worse. Uh, and you know the reason I say it isn't a post-America Middle East yet because I, I believe the next administration, whomever it is, will take a different posture. Not that this is a, and here I agree with Tom, look this is a tremendously complicated reality now. But Ted, you pointed out, you know, I was part of putting together the coalition in 1991. I spent, I was with Baker every step of the way in doing that. You know, the truth is, when the United States has a clear objective in mind, we also find that others are more likely to, to join with us. When it looks like we're not clear on what we do, 
when it looks like we're creating a kind of binary choice where in Syria, you know, either we're going to do nothing or we're going to put boots on the ground. Or, uh, you know, in the Israeli-Palestinian issue, either we're going to do nothing or we solve the whole problem. Well, when it turns out that you can't solve the whole problem, when it turns out you're not going to put boots on the ground in terms of combat forces, all right, don't let that, the fear of doing that, put you in a position where you do nothing as your alternative. There are a series of things that you do in between. What I tried to suggest about how you could, you could use our leverage, if, if there are multiple countries who want us to create a safe haven, including in Europe, by the way, well then, you use that as a lever to get others to make a contribution as well. President Obama wants to share the burden. He's completely right to want to share the burden, but it's very difficult to share the burden when you say up front, there's a, <coughs> there's a profound limit on what we are prepared to do. We don't have to be putting combat forces into, on, into the ground in Syria, but if we want to have a political outcome there, we are going to have to identify a clear objective, which isn't an abstraction. We want a political process. A political process is a slogan. What are you actually going to do to create it? Putting together a conference doesn't create a political process. Actually demonstrating what you're prepared to do to change the situation creates a, creates a reality where others begin to respond to you. You are right that there's a much bigger problem looming for us if Egypt were to become a failed state. Uh, you have to have a, co a coherent approach to the region as a whole. The more difficult it get becomes doesn't become an argument for doing nothing. It becomes an argument for thinking through what are your choices, what is your potential leverage, how do you get others to play a role that you would like them to play. In 1991, we brought others into something that they initially weren't going to do themselves. But our leadership is what ultimately produced a coalition that was quite effective. <coughs> You're about. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to first uh, respond to uh, what Ambassador Ross said about the refugees. Uh, I certainly did not mean to say that the refugees were Islamist, but the important point is that why after four or five years we suddenly see almost one million refugees rushing to Europe? Why do we see that? And we said, and uh, the actual reason is, and I would like to tell you, is because <coughs> for the past four or five years, those refugee, we haven't been taking care of those refugees who were in refugee camps in Lebanon, in Jordan, and Turkey, who were living miserably uh, in, in these places, with no heaters, in tents, with no air conditioning during summer, with no education, uh, $17 support per person in Lebanon in coupons. So what do we expect them to have? Those people were looking for, for, for human rights, were looking for democracy, were looking to live in dignity. We have, left the, we have let them down. Of course now they're going to come to, to, they're not coming directly from, the, from Syria to, to Europe. The, those people were in the refugees camp, they have suffered a lot, and now they're ending up, they have suffered so much that they've been risking their lives trying to reach uh, Europe. But if we have to think of, of uh, if you put yourself at, at the Islamist's place, that would be a perfect time for them to send sleeping cells to, to infiltrate <laughs> those, those refugees, to send people into Europe and, 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 and to the West. And as you know, once they are in the West, they could go all over. You can, they cannot keep them in Germany, you cannot keep them in Europe, they could come to the States, they could go all over. Uh, on, on the other issue, when, when, when you spoke about uh, the regime, yes, you're right, the regime is a dictatorship. You're right, it's a horrible regime, and I'm sure Ambassador Ross knows, knows exactly how much we've suffered ourselves from the, from the regime in Syria. But why have you left the democratic opposition? Why have you left us alone? People, when they rose in Syria, and in the Middle East, they were looking towards West. They were not looking towards East. They were looking to the United States, to Europe. They were looking for the democracies and the lives we were having here. And this is the life that they wanted for themselves. Why have we stood back and allowed our so-called allies, with whom we don't share a lot in common today? What do we share with Saudi Arabia, who is not much different with the, with the Islamic State? They hang people, they cut people's heads off, they cut people's hands off, they, they, are, uh, they, they follow Sharia law, women are not allowed to drive, women cannot leave without a permission from their husband or family. And that I'm saying, it. you know, you are a friend of, of Saudi Arabia, we are friends of Saudi Arabia, and you know that. My father was very good, a close friend to the king of Saudi Arabia, but that doesn't mean that if someone is your friend, you should not tell him that he's wrong. Our cousin in Syria and my uncle before him were close family and we told them we were wrong. We left the country and we had to fight, and a lot of our people died for, 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 you know, for this reason, who were persecuted by the regime, but we have to tell them when they're wrong. 
And we have to tell our partners in Saudi Arabia when they start affecting our national security that what they're doing is dangerous for us and dangerous for the whole world. And fortunately, we stood in the back and allowed Saudi and Qatar to compete for hegemony. Qatar was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, as you've seen in Tunisia when the uprising started, as you've seen in Libya, as you've seen in Egypt, and they wanted to again in Syria. And Saudi Arabia has rushed to, cut, to counter Qatar's influence by supporting the Salafi Wahhabis. And this is after a while we found out that, oh my God, these were ISIS. These were Saddam Hussein's soldiers. It was too late. They already had the funds. There are people who, with great numbers, with a, a huge armies, which again was a failure of United States and our policies in Iraq when we went in by sending home 2 million Ba'athists and over 900,000 soldiers telling them they have no more jobs. Because why? Because again, we replaced a dictatorship by people who are not much better, by people who, it's not because they're not much better, but unfortunately in the Middle East, people still don't understand what democracy means. They understand it as majority rules over the minority and we kill the rest. And this cannot exist. What did we expect when we sent 900,000 people home, in, in, Iraqi soldiers home, and 2 million Ba'athists, who happened to be Sunnis, because that's how the, the, the Middle East functions. What did you expect? Weren't they going to rise at some point? When we left Iraq, all those people who were left without a, a job, weren't they going to fight against us? This is one point. On the other point, also Turkey, when you say about uh, creating a safe zone. I think this would be a disaster, and this would be giving uh, Erdogan, our dear friend Erdogan, who's not as much different, and you know, uh, in, he's also an Islamist party, who I quote, who said, democracy is the train we will board to our destination. He also said, if you remember a poet, in, I think in the 90s, he was jailed for it. He said, the barracks, uh, the, the mosques are our barracks, the domes are our helmets, the minarets are our bayonets, and the believers are our soldiers. This is our allies in Turkey. And we should not give them this opportunity, this is what they want, to go south, to, 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 they, they, because they were refused in Europe, now they look at the, middle, at the Middle East as their new Ottoman Empire where they could spread their tentacles. When we asked them to, to, to fight the Islamic State, what did they do? Instead, they went and are fighting our Kurdish allies. You know, today, after all this time, instead of founding, uh, uh, instead of helping create and bring together a Syrian democratic opposition who believes and share our values, we went on, we, let, we stood in the back and allowed uh, you know, those countries to create in opposition, mainly the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey. And then after 18 months when Hillary Clinton said they do not represent the Syrian people, it took her 18 months to say that. Then we went to, guess where, Qatar, another democratic country, to create the new opposition. Uh, the, you know, obviously, it was not uh, you know, uh, democratic because we had to add the Salafis to this new opposition to uh, our friend the Saudis, who were not upset they didn't have people, who were upset they didn't have people rep represent them. And, and this is what has created this chaos. Today, when you say, what should we do? I think the most important, before we start thinking of safe, safe zone, is to cr help create this new opposition that we could back. When we, call, uh, when we have a conference and call for all those groups who believe in our values and of equality of all citizens under the rule of law, regardless of religion, sect, ethnic group, and gender, then we will see if those, then we will have an opposition that we could back. 100% that share our values. The Islamist would certainly not accept, so why should we back them? An Islamist who's not, uh, who would not accept the equality of a woman and a man, why should we back him? An Islamist who is not uh, uh, you know, going to accept an equality between a Christian and a Muslim, why should we back him? An Islamist who is not going to support the equality and accept the equality of a, an Alawite, a Shia, and a Sunni, all as citizens under the rule of law, why should we back those people? Today, who we're going to talk to? You're right. Who we're going to talk to? Those opposition fighters. You're saying the rebels and, and the regime. Yes, the regime is terrible. We all know that. It's fact. It's not like it's, it's something new that we're saying. But we have to look on the other side. Who are those other people on the side? Unfortunately, we left it too long, and now we ended up, as you said, backing the Iraq, the Kurdish forces. But Mr. Ross, you did not tell us who are those Kurdish forces. Does do you know all of you in this room that those Kurdish forces are the allies of the regime? that Saleh Muslim and the PYD are allies of the regime, and they were created to counter uh, Turkey's, uh, when, when Turkey sent those Islamists uh, to take uh, uh, over in Syria. The Assad regime, of course, they went and did the same. They used the Kurdish card and said, you want to play the Islamist card, we'll play the Kurdish card. And this, they, gave, they armed those, uh, you know, the PYD and others. Uh, to go and, 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 you know, uh, and, and be on, I mean, have kind of an autonomous zone on, on, uh, on Tur Turkey's border. And today, after all this time, uh, after, I mean, uh, the U.S. has been supporting them, the first thing they did 
when the Russians came in, they said, we welcome Russia's bombing of those rebels. And the second thing they did, they declared an, uh, an autonomous region, and they said, we're going to open a mission in Moscow. Great allies. This is the allies that we have. I'm not against it, but I'm just telling you, we found ourselves, because of our lack, we found ourselves backing the, the allies of the Syrian regime. I think I, I'll let Ted respond, but... Okay. Tom. Um, you know, for... For years, I had the duty, the privilege, whatever you want to call it, of watching Dennis Ross and his colleagues try to sort out the Israel-Palestine problem. And um, a lot of the conversations around that <coughs> involved the question of who was responsible for the situation in which we found ourselves in the first place. And sometimes it got down to the to arguments about really detailed issues like was there really a massacre at Der Yassin, okay? And I finally developed the attitude that I don't care whether there was a massacre at Der Yassin or what did the Balfour Declaration really do. What I want to know is where do we go from here, okay? And that, so that's, I, as Ronald Reagan famously said, mistakes were made. Yes, indeed. Everybody made mistakes. Right now, I don't care, right? What I want to know is where do we go from here, and I would caution all of you, in my view, that it's a mistake to believe that the outcome, the destination, where we're going to be in 10 or maybe 15 years, because that's how long it's going to take, is dependent entirely or even mainly on us, the United States, right? In order to know where we're going to be in 15 years, you have to tell me the answers to the following questions. What is the next phase of the Iranian Revolution? All revolutions evolve. The Iranian Revolution is evolving. There's a huge power struggle going on in Iran between the Rouhani types and the IRGC types. And we can, in some ways, subtly encourage one side or the other and encourage that, encourage that evolution. But until you know the outcome of that, you can't control any of these other things. Turkey is another example, right? I know people in Saudi Arabia who deeply believe that Erdogan is more like Al-Qaeda than he is like a EU Democrat, right? If that turns out to be true, then we have a whole other question to ask. You have to tell me the answer to that question, right? And finally, you have to be able to tell me who is going to be in charge and pursuing what line of policy in Saudi Arabia in 10 or 15 years. The Saudis don't know that themselves. They have their own internal issues going on, right? We can perhaps influence with deft footwork the outcomes of some of these uh, conversations and developments, but it's not up to us. We don't control them. Okay. Can I? Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll turn it to questions from the floor. <clears throat> there is no doubt that we can't control what happens there, and the internal dynamics are going to be the most important element that sort of shapes where things will and how things will evolve. But it's also a mistake to think that if we sit on the sidelines and do nothing, that we have no ability to influence what happens there, and we do have, there are consequences for us. We learned a long time ago that the pathologies of this region don't stay there. In a sense, I agree completely with you. Where do we go from here? One of the reasons I focus on a safe haven is if we don't do that, I see things getting much worse. I'm not unmindful of, of Turkey and Erdogan. One of the reasons I'm saying, look, you want us to create a safe haven. All of them say they want us to create a safe haven. I want them to do something at the same time. I want there to be one address for who manages the opposition in terms of money. I want us to be it. I want us to use that leverage. As I listen to you, on the one hand, I'm completely sympathetic to what you want in terms of values. Absolutely, you're, you're right. The question is, again, how do we get from here to there? When I listen to you, I'm worried that the implication is, OK, we'll end up re relying on the regime. Well, we know what that means. What they're trying to do right now is basically depopulate the country. So the question is, how do we, how do we affect that? How do we affect the balance of power there? The safe haven concept is one way to try to do that. And I, I do think your question, Tom, is right. How do we go from where we are to where we want to go? I'm very worried about those who basically want to step back and say there's not much to be done. 
Because when we step back, I see who rushes in. And those who rush in are going to make the situa situation a whole lot worse because they don't share our values. We will make mistakes, but oftentimes, you know, at least if we're trying to shape a reality uh, and we have it and we spell out a clear objective, we have more of a chance, I think, to influence that set of, of unfolding dynamics than if we sit on the sideline and basically say, well, we'll let others do it. And let me just add one thing. That, to me, was the critical fundamental importance of the Iran nuclear deal. Not just the nuclear program per se, but the question of trying to encourage the Iranian revolution to evolve in a way that will turn out to be constructive. Okay, yes, question there? One second, we'll get the microphone to you. It's coming. Thank you. Um, first of all, sir, I, I commend you on your work. I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I have a question. Uh, the the U.S. was um, so pull the mic up. The U.S. was so adamant at first, um, you know, to go against Assad's regime. Um, do you think that the Russians coming in um, basically? more or less tacitly made a sort of back off um, to allow the Russians to sort of team up with Assad? Um, or do you think that that just kind of happened on its own, so to speak? Yes. Uh, can, I, can I respond to it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, l l let me uh, explain that. I, actually, you have to look at, uh, uh, you know, at, at how things happened in, in, in Syria. The Russians did not come in on their own. Uh, we all have to know that it was the Iranians who has asked the Russians to come in. Qasem Soleimani, who's the general head of the Quds forces, went to Russia and asked for the Russians to come in. Why? Because they saw that the regime was in, in, in a, a great difficulty, and they have promised them, of, uh, of course, uh, that they will pay money. The Russians are not going to come without anything. Of course, they will be paid. They have uh, their uh, strategic uh, you know, uh, bases in, in Syria, which you know, also they will protect. Uh, and they will make sure that those uh, Islamists uh, that are coming from uh, the surrounding countries around Russia, they, that, you know, that they will go and fight them in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, but why did Iran do that? Iran is now uh, working on, on getting back, as you know, the funds that they have. They, they, have, they want their fund released. And they, want, they do not want to play a major role. I mean, uh, they did not want to send, for example, 10,000 soldiers that would have been all over the media, that could have uh, kind of uh, made uh, problems for, for Iranians and, and uh, U.S. deals uh, about their nuclear program. Uh, but now that the Russian went, and everybody is busy with the Russian bombing every day, that Iranians are now sending troops, but nobody cares. Nobody cares because everybody is really looking at what the Russians are doing. Uh, but it's also, we cannot ask people, we always tell, you know, we cannot ask people why they are you know, supporting their own interest. It's not our, 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 our thing to do. We have to look for our interest, and they're looking for their own interest. It's like we're asking, you, how could you ask your enemy, why aren't you bombing ISIS? Why, uh, why, uh, why are you bombing just al-Nusra and other al-Qaeda groups? That's up to them who they want to bomb. You know? <laughs> if, they want, if, they want to protect, if they want to protect their own areas, uh, which is logical, they want to protect the place where they have their bases, you know, the, uh, you know, in, in the coastal area, and then they might move to ISIS. They might not. They might tell the United States and, and Western co countries, show us, why aren't you bombing ISIS too? You have been there for a year. Obviously, you are not very serious uh, about bombing them because between, between 20 and, and 30 airstrikes a day, I, I don't see it uh, to, to be a much uh, serious effort. You know, it, it took us, a, a, I mean, uh, a year to, to, to do 7,000, I mean, to have 7,000 strikes, while Russia has been there for a month now, and they have over 1,000 strikes. So it shows that there's no genuine efforts on our part. And ISIS has been gaining ground, you know? So now a lot of people, when Russia went in, they went in knowing that international public opinion, not only Russia's public opinion, is backing them. You hear a lot of people in France and a lot of places here to say, oh, thanks God, now the Russians went in. Oh, thanks God, now the Russians went in to help us fight those extremists. You know, even President Obama said, we had pretty good intelligence there coming. Okay, great, then why didn't you do anything about it? You know? So that means, in a way, indirectly or implicitly, we wanted that to happen. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, Hank Rose, uh, the uh, Worcester Council. Uh, first to Mimi and Bill, uh, thanks for organizing this fantastic panel. Uh, question is this, uh, Mr. Assad suggested that we have some cooperation with Russia uh, in Syria. For that to work, both parties have got to see some mutual benefit. What benefit can we suggest to Russia for cooperating with us? Look, there, <clears throat> I think the essence uh, of, of what would be a mutual benefit would be that the Russians would know at the end of the day that they're not going to lose their place in Syria. I mean, that's, you yeah, understand why Putin is there. Putin is there for the reasons I was saying before. It is true that they coordinated this with the Iranians. Ghassan Soleimani, in violation of sanctions, he's not supposed to be able to travel, but he went to Moscow. Uh, and they coordinated what was going to be the Russian intervention. You don't suddenly move these kinds of forces that the Russians do without significant logistic planning. So it took time. He went there immediately after the deal on the Iranian nuclear issue was concluded. And so this was coordinated. Now, why? Because the Russians also began to fear that the regime might collapse. Uh, and a collapse of the regime for them is a disaster because the one place for Putin where you actually have and have had a, a Russian position, a military position in the Middle East, has been in Tartus in Syria. So now, you know, the, the Russians are fortifying their position in Syria. They're sending a message that, as I said, there'll be no outcome in Syria that Russia doesn't influence. Uh, and the message, you know, everywhere, when I go throughout the Middle East, what is it the Russians are saying to the Arabs? They're saying, you may not like that we're siding with Assad, but the truth is we stand by our friends. Compare us to, to the Americans. Do they stand by their friends? This is a message I hear all the time when I'm out in the region. So. What is it we can do that's, that reflects a mutual interest? Well, we can make it clear. At the end of the day, any political process, we're not interested in seeing an outcome in Syria where Russia loses its potential to have an influence. Now, if we actually want to have a, a Syria that actually isn't partitioned, and I don't know if we're going to end up with a Syria that can be put back together again. I don't think, by the way, I don't think the Russians care. I don't think they care. Because as long as, and it, by the way, it's clearly the Iranians don't. Ghassan Soleimani, if you look at what they do, they basically promote Shia militias everywhere. And the Shia militias are designed to weaken the central authority or to create leverage on the central authority. That's what they do everywhere they are. And the Russians may be in a similar place unless they think somehow it's going to contribute and rebound back against them. So, I'm not against trying to work out something with the Russians in Syria. I'm just not yet persuaded that the Russians share the same objective. I would like, and I, by the way, I would not at this point have brought the Iranians into the negotiations. I accept that by the end of a process, the Iranians have to be there. But in a sense, we're allowing the Iranians to play a role there before they've done anything that shows they're prepared to be constructive. You know, what it does is it raises, again, the question of what are our purposes? I, too, want to influence where the Iranians go. But I think, you know, what, what produced the Iranian nuclear deal? What produced it was a, an approach, which I helped to conceptualize in the first term, which was build the pressures on the Iranians but leave them a way out. Why did they negotiate this deal? Because they want sanctions relief. You want to empower the Rouhani types? Make it clear that what Soleimani is doing in the rest of the region costs. If it looks like the Iranians are gaining from that, then that, that part of the, the struggle within Iran, they gain, they don't lose. Does this mean that going forward, you be sitting down with Russia and trying to find common ground? I, I couldn't hear the question. Should we then, going forward, try to sit down with Russia and agree on what we can have which is mutually acceptable. We would perhaps not want the Assad regime to continue. You've said that the Russia d does want that. We need to find some compromise with Russia. Should we sit and talk to them? No, there's, of course we should sit and talk to them. There has, look, I think, 
I was uneasy that we, lo that we didn't really have a high-level channel with them directly to Putin. But I, but the, you know, Putin is someone who, where he seeks weakness, he will exploit it. He is someone who's big on transactions. You know, he is, what does Putin want? In 1971, Alexei Kosygin was the premier of the Soviet Union. And he said, there is no question anywhere in the world that can be resolved without the Soviet Union. And what Putin wants is to reestablish that. He is driven by trying to restore the image of Russia as a great power. He has said that the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. As I like to say, that wasn't even the worst geopolitical strategy for the Russians. But it tells you all you want to know about what drives him. And he exploits that domestically. Look, at a time when inflation is very high in Russia, when they're in a recession, when the price of oil having dropped uh, has added to and made, made their economic problems quite profound, he has 80% support. He's the envy of any democratic leader. He is playing on this sense of loss of stature and status. So yes, we should be talking to him, but we also have to talk to him in a way that shows we have some leverage. He respects that. And that means, again, we have to think about how do you build your leverage? How do you make yourself sufficiently relevant that he has an interest not only in talking, he has an interest in talking, of course. But right now, he feels he has the leverage. And he thinks that basically we will concede to what he wants. I'm not persuaded that he is very much interested in the kind of Syria that you're talking about. Of course not. But can I say just to, to yeah. add a word? Uh, I'm sure that uh, you know, Putin has his own agenda in, in Syria. And I'm sure Putin, when we talk to President Putin, I think we have to accept uh, that he's, we're talking to someone from the old regime, someone who's uh, a KGB person, someone who sees uh, Russia as uh, all powerful, as, uh, you know, again, as the Soviet Union used to be. But that's how he is. He has, the only thing Russia has today is this very strong military. And if they don't push with their military, with their strength, they, will, they know very well that they will lose everything in a few years. So this is what he's doing. And, we, you know, and on the other side, uh, Russia and, and Syria, which you just called their friends, have, you know, they have a lot of things in common. But what do we have? We said we have to protect our friends. What do we have in common with our friends? Why should we protect them? If we are to, the problem today, we're not anymore 20 years ago where people don't have access to internet and all, all the social media, other things. Today, young people all over the world could see our hypocrisy when they tell us, we call on democracy and freedom in one country, and then our friends, we go run to Saudi Arabia and other countries uh, to sell them weapons or to, deal, uh, to, to do some deals with them. You see, young people today are able to see that. And if we don't try to show them that we are for our values everywhere. If we are for human rights and democracy and freedom, we have to be for them everywhere. We have to support them everywhere. We cannot be dupli you know, uh, duplicit about, about our, our relationship with our friends. And regarding Iran, when you said you would not agree also to Iran coming into the negotiation. Well, I disagree. I said, I said now. At this moment, yes. But I said, at this moment, if we don't agree to Iran coming into the negotiation, you're right. But we shouldn't also agree to Saudi, Qatar, and Turkey to come either. It's either we bring all those actors in or we don't bring them. And also, why, if you blame Iran, Iran is true, it's gain, it gains hegemony. It's true that Iran wants to get control of over the Middle East because they also, like Turkey, have uh, you know, this uh, uh, ambition of taking over the, the, the Middle East using the Shia Arabs. But who has made it possible for them? It is our friends, our so-called allies. Because instead of uh, standing up to the Iranians with Arab nationalism, we went and used sectarianism. This is perfect for Iran. We handed all the Shia Arabs, all the minorities to them. And then we say why the Iranians are controlling, why are they fighting in this area or others. We thought that they wanted all of Iraq, all of Syria, and uh, you know, up to, to, to Iran and Lebanon. Actually, it's not true, as you said. They, they don't want all of uh, Iraq and all Syria. They don't care about all Iraq and all Syria. They want the areas that they know today they have full support. All the, the, the parts where the Shia Iraqis are, the, Kur, uh, the Kurdish part, and the coastal parts in Syria up to Damascus and Lebanon. Why? Because, again, we have pushed all those minorities in the laps of the Iranian, including the Houthis in, in Yemen, who were closer, who are closer to the Sunnis, you know, in their beliefs than to the Shias. 
we started saying they are Shia Iranians, uh, they, they're trying to, you know, and, and we, we, they actually pushed them into the, the, the Houthis were like, but we're not Shias, same as, as the Alawis or, or, or same as the Ismailis or the Kurds, we're not Shia Muslims, but who's here to, to defend us? Who's here to stand with us? If the United States is not here, if Europe is not here, if the West is not here to stand uh, with us against those barbarians who are inciting hatred, sectarian violence and hatred, who's going to protect us? We'll go to Iran, we'll go to Russia, we'll go to North Korea if it's, if it's possible. You know? This is why it's very important that we have to side with those minorities. It's not by creating a safe zone, because creating a safe zone is going to be kind of saying we are with the Sunnis to talk with the a regime in Syria and the minorities. Why should the United States be, be, be taking sides, be taking sectarian sides in this conflict. You know, we should be above that. We should be in the country. Why don't we talk to the Alawites? Why don't we talk to the Christians? Why don't we talk to the minorities? You, you don't I, think... I, go ahead. Sorry. Look, I, 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 I got to add something to this. I, I, I think it's unrealistic to the point of being naive to think, believe, imagine, or hope that the United States of America is going to construct and tailor its strategic policies in the world on the basis of human rights and our values. We have never done that. And we certainly haven't done it in the Middle East. And Jimmy Carter, remember Jimmy Carter? His entire foreign policy was, was based on human rights. Except I was in Riyadh when Jimmy Carter showed up in 1978. Right. And he kissed the hem of their garments because he wanted the Saudis to support the Sadat Peace Initiative. Right? Yes. That came first. He didn't care about whether women could drive. Right? And I want to tell you a really embarrassing recent example. Look what happened in Bahrain, in the Arab Spring, when the oppressed Sunni majority excuse me, Shia majority right. in Bahrain rose up against a unreconstructed um, Sunni monarchy, right? The United States didn't say boo because we have interests in Bahrain that overrode the human rights issue, namely the Sixth Fleet, right? So it's fine, I, I really, it's fine. Make, go where your values think you should go to the extent that you can. But in the Middle East, it's not going to take you very far. I, I, I actually agree with Another the question. Winston. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is my uh, it is an unfortunate uh, responsibility yes. that I have to bring this excellent discussion to an end. It is a privilege to have worked with Mimi Gregory and Ambassador McNamara to facilitate this excellent panel. We have Tom Lippman, whose book, uh, Hero of the Crossing, How Anwar Sadat and the 1973 War Changed the World, coming out next January, and I hope that you will continue to visit local councils to present on that book. Ambassador Dennis Ross's book, which is Doomed to Succeed, the U.S.-Israel Relationship from Truman to Obama. There are copies here. I invite you to purchase the book and have Ambassador Ross sign it. Maybe you will get in another question or two. And to Rubal al-Assad for sharing your heart and your mind on your region and the difficulties and challenges faced by your people. Thank you very much for being here with us, coming from London to present to the World Affairs Councils of America. Thank you so much. Thank you.